So as I said, the thing that Grice is interested in is the relationship between use on the one hand, the fact that we use words and sentences in particular ways, and meaning, the fact that sentences mean particular things. And our question is, well, what's the relationship between these two things? It stands to reason there's some relationship. It's the fact that we use words in particular ways, that's sort of what makes them mean things in the first place. But what exactly is it about the way that we use them? What exactly is it that makes words meaningful? The very first thing that Grice does in this article is that he tries to be careful about what exactly we mean by meaning. As he points out, there are actually a number of different distinct concepts here, and we have to be careful exactly which one we have in mind. So he makes in particular two distinctions that are going to be important for us. The first is the distinction between natural and non-natural meaning, and the second is the distinction between uh, occasion and timeless meaning. So let's start with natural versus non-natural first. What's the difference between natural and non-natural meaning? Well, we can get into it by just thinking about certain kinds of examples. So here's one class of examples. You might say, we might say things like, spots like that mean measles, or smoke means fire, or those clouds mean rain. These are all examples of what Grice calls natural meaning. And on the other hand, we have non-natural meaning. So what might examples of those be? So one example might be something like, three rings on the bus means that it's about to stop. A green light means go. The sentence, the cat is on the mat, means that the cat is on the mat. So those are two different classes of examples. And let's think about what the difference between them is. Well, the first class of examples all involve sort of natural phenomenon. You know, we're talking about smoke meaning fire, or spots meaning measles, or rain clouds meaning rain. So in all these cases, a certain natural phenomenon seems to mean something. And in this case, it doesn't really seem like, you know, our intentions or our, you know, our, our psychology has really anything to do about it. The fact that rain, the, the fact that clouds like that mean rain, that's something that's true independently of us. So would it would be, you know, we don't need to do anything to make that true. So in general, we can think of this class as nat of natural meaning as a kind of meaning that actually doesn't depend on humans or, or language users or people communicating at all. And to say that one thing naturally means another is something very close to just saying that it's the first thing is evidence for the second. So like when you say those spots mean measles, that means something very close to saying those spots are evidence for measles. Smoke means fire, that means, uh, that's again very close to saying those spots are evidence for fire. And finally, those clouds mean rain, again that means something very similar to just those clouds are evidence that it's going to rain. So that's kind of roughly what's meant by natural meaning. It doesn't really depend on us, rather it seems to be something more like one thing being evidence for another. Let's think about the class of non-natural meaning. So remember one of our examples was three rings on the bus mean that it's full. This is clearly something kind of different, like whether three rings on the bus mean it's full is a fact that depends on us. It depends on that we've adapted, adopted a particular convention that when we want people to know that the bus is full that will ring the driver will ring the bell three times. Likewise, the fact that a green light means go, again, that's something that in some sense is dependent on us. The fact that a green light is associated with permission to, to start driving, that's something that we decided. And we could have decided to do it differently. We could have decided that red was the signal to go and green was the signal to stop, but that's just not what we did. And the same seems to go in the case of the sentence. So the fact that the, the, the sentence, the cat is on the mat, means that the cat is on the mat, well, it's not, obviously it's actually true, but it's clearly something that could have been different. If we had chosen to make cat mean dog and mat mean ceiling, then the sentence the cat is on the mat would have, mean, would have meant something very different. So again, in this example, it's the fact that we decide to pair meanings with words or pair meanings with certain kinds of things in certain kinds of ways. That's what makes them meaningful in the first place. So that's on a very high level how we can distinguish the two kinds of things. Natural meaning... It's something kind of independent of us, for one thing to naturally mean another, really is just for the first to be evidence for the second. But clearly there's more going on in the case of non-natural meaning. There, the fact that something non-naturally means something is dependent on us in a certain way. And this looks like much more like the kind of category we're interested in when we think about language. When we want to say that a sentence means something, the meaning in that sense looks a lot more like non-natural meaning than it does natural meaning. The lesson of all this so far is that when we want to think about meaning in a particular linguistic meaning, 
the kind of meaning we're interested in is non-natural meaning. So that's what we want to focus on. Something that's important to say, though, is that while it seems right that non-natural meaning is the kind of meaning that words have, it's not exclusively words that have non-natural meaning. Because think about some of the examples we already gave, like three rings of the bell mean that the bus is full. That's not like a word. It's not like a linguistic expression or a sentence or anything like that, the three rings of the bell. But nonetheless, it can mean something in this sense. So the notion of meaning that's involved in language is broader than just applying to language. Other things can mean stuff in the same sense. Now, language and meaning, meaning in language does have special properties that we'll talk about later on, but the general concept doesn't seem to be exclusive to language. That's our first distinction between natural and non-natural meaning. So we said the other distinction is between meaning something on an occasion and meaning something, what we'll say, timelessly. So what would be an example of something that means something on an occasion, but, but not that thing timelessly? Well, for instance, imagine we're in the kitchen and the stove catches fire, and I start yelling to catch your attention. In, this, in that kind of case, if I yell in the right way to catch your attention in the right way, we might plausibly say that my yelling at you means that the stove is on fire. But that's not what my yelling would mean on all occasions. In a different kind of situation, my yelling might mean something very different. So for instance, if we're crossing the street and there's a car coming, I might start shouting at you, I might start yelling again. In that situation, my yelling might mean that there's a car coming and that you should get out of the way. In a very different kind of situation, suppose we're lost, you're on one side of the forest, I'm on the other side, I might start yelling, in that kind of situation, my yelling might mean I'm over here or come in this direction or something like that. And we can imagine I'm yelling at the exact same pitch, the exact same loudness, all the kind of, all the sound of my yelling is exactly the same in all three situations. But it means to have something different in each situation because of the situation that I'm in. So that would be an example of, let's, let's call it an utterance, an utterance which means something on a particular occasion, but actually means different things on different occasions. In one case, my yelling means the stove is on fire. In another case, it means get out of the way, there's a car coming. And in the final case, my yelling means I'm over here, come look for me over here. Focus on the case of the stove. In that case, that's a case where my yelling means on a particular occasion that the stove is on fire, but it doesn't have that meaning timelessly. Because to have a meaning timelessly is basically to generally, to always or generally mean that thing. So the screaming or the yelling is something that might mean something on a particular occasion, but doesn't have that meaning timelessly. What would be examples of things that mean things timelessly? Well here, language is kind of the main example. So we'll focus on a French sentence, like take the French sentence, le chat est sur le tapis. That is something that has a timeless meaning. It generally, its timeless meaning is the cat is on the mat. Now, it will also mean that on particular occasions. So if I say that to French speakers on particular occasions, it will tend to, to mean exactly what it timelessly means. But unlike the previous example, there isn't this di difference between what it means on particular occasions and what it means timelessly. In the previous example, there just wasn't any timeless meaning to the, to, to the yelling. It, what it meant, if it meant anything, depended on the context. With timeless meaning, if something means something timelessly, it will also tend to mean it on a particular occasion. Um, but saying that, be, because saying that something means something timelessly is a stronger claim about it. So our main examples of things that mean things timelessly will be linguistic examples. But again, not necessarily all of them will be linguistic. So if you think about, again, actually, the ringing of the bell, if there's a certain convention that associates ringing the bell with like something like the bus being full, or traffic lights, the fact that green means go, again, that's something that's that, that doesn't really depend on the context. It doesn't matter what the traffic is like at a particular intersection, green always means go, red always means stop. So those are examples of non-linguistic timeless meaning. So again, there's a distinction. This time it's between meaning on a particular occasion and timeless meaning. It's something we see with language and utterances, 
but it doesn't just apply to those. There are, and in particular, there are things that are like non-linguistic signals we can send to each other that have timeless meaning as well as meaning on a particular occasion. So basically what Grice does in the article is he focuses mostly on the notion of non-natural meaning on a particular occasion. Why does he do that? Well, the reason basically is, if we're thinking about sentence meaning, really in the end it seems like we want to understand timeless meaning. So the fact that you know a particular sentence of English means what it does, that's just another way of saying it has a particular timeless meaning. And the same goes for all languages. So the fact that the cat is on the mat means that the cat is on the mat, that's a, that's a timeless fact about its meaning. Likewise for the French sentence that means the same thing. But Grice's hope is that we can basically analyze the notion of timeless meaning in terms of meaning on a particular occasion. That once we understand the notion of meaning something on a particular occasion, it will be much easier to understand the notion of meaning something timelessly. Because there's a natural way in which the two might be connected. We might say that, well, a sentence means something or means what it does, just in general, whenever you utter that sentence, you non-naturally mean what the sentence timelessly means. So, for instance, the sentence le chat est sur le, ta le tapis means that the cat is on the mat because, in general, when that sentence is uttered, the French sentence, it tends to, on, it tends to non naturally mean on that occasion that the cat is on the mat. So, that's the general idea about how we might try to understand timeless meaning by focusing in particular on non natural occasion meaning. So, that's why Grice spends most of the paper talking about non-natural occasion meaning. Because the idea is, well, once we have understood that, the more general notion of meaning which applies to language should just sort of fall out of it naturally. So we've made two distinctions between natural and non-natural meaning and between occasion and timeless meaning. And we've said that for most of the paper, what we're really going to be interested in is the idea of non-natural meaning on a particular occasion. This is what Grice is going to spend most of his energy trying to understand.